before we get to today's heat check, I just want to remind everyone to join our Ringer NBA community on social media. If you're looking for a place to share your hot playoff takes with other like-minded folks, search Ringer NBA on Facebook. And if you're in need of a hub for all things hoops related, make sure to follow at Ringer NBA on Twitter. And now, heat check. Welcome to Heat Check. I'm your host, John Gonzalez, joined as I am every week by my producer, Isaac Lee. Hey, hey. Isaac, interesting Sunday here in the NBA world. It began womp womp with the Sixers, which we will get to in short order. But I want to just bring up like some of the pregame stuff that happened in Philadelphia. Our guy sure. Tyler Tynes went to the game in Philadelphia. And were you aware of the Mike Scott tattoo that one of the Sixers fans got on his rib? <laughs> Not until Tynes tweeted about it. So he tweeted about something else. This guy who listens to the Rights to Ricky Sanchez podcast, Shots to Our Guys, said if he got to a certain amount of followers, he'd get a Mike Scott tattoo on his ah, ribs. Ah, okay. And then, and I was unaware of this too until Tynes tweeted it out. Tynes was in the parking lot at the Sixers game and somehow ran into another Sixers fan. And I don't know how this conversation ensued, but it did. And it led to this guy pulling down part of his pants <laughs> to show that this tattoo had been the same tattoo that a different fan had gotten on his ribs. He got on his ash cheek. <laughs> That's Incredible. what's happening in Philadelphia. <laughs> Incredible stuff. And I want to say to Heat Check listeners, we had previously talked about Isaac doing something for a GoFundMe for a haircut. But Isaac has generously volunteered to that, get the okay. Mike Scott ass tattoo. No, 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 no. What's the price for this, Isaac? <laughs> the price for this? Oh, man. <laughs> In the million somewhere, like 50, maybe to $100 million. So we're almost there. We're going to raise the capital. <laughs> almost <Isaac's>, there. <laughs> we're, we're pretty close. We're pretty close. Yeah. I thought everything was going Philly's way, Isaac, between the ass tattoo and then also your guy Boban was holding a chihuahua yes, pregame yes. for reasons extremely, surpassing understanding. Extremely here for Boban holding very small objects and or animals. Very small objects. Ian Carmel said that that was actually a full-size golden retriever. <laughs> <laughs> Not yeah. a chihuahua, but it was a good sight gag. I would have believed it. I would have believed it. It was a good sight gag. Check out all that stuff. And uh, I want to thank all of you guys for listening. Please rate and review us and all all of our fantastic Ringer NBO shows and pods. We have lots of great content on theringer.com. Robert Mays, Robert Mays, a football writer, went mm. to Milwaukee, wrote about basketball in the box. That was a good story. You should read it. Paolo and Haley have been all over the winners and losers from every single game in the playoffs. I wrote about a non-playoff story. Ty Lu is evidently taking the Lakers gig. <laughs> And uh, I hope you read my yeah. story, but the short of it is, Ty Lu, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Like, tough stuff, Ty Lu. I, uh, guess, I guess it's a gig, man. Good luck in it. This makes me so happy. Uh, later on in the show, Danny Chow hasn't been here in a while. He's going to join us to talk about Bucks and Celtics, and uh, also he'll talk about the Rockets climbing back into the series against the Warriors. But first, there was basketball today on Sunday. I mentioned Womp womp, my Philadelphia 76ers, we're going to get into that. And also just wrapped up the Portland and Denver game four. So we're going to talk about that right away. And for that, you know what? This is a fun day. It's been a fun day of basketball. And Sunday we need, fun day. Sunday fun day. We needed somebody interesting, somebody who hasn't appeared on Heat Check in a while. I'm excited. Let's bring him in. Boom shakalaka. He's heating up. All right, joining me in the studio is the co-host of One Shining Podcast. He's one half of the Duffel Bag Boys. I see him on the lot right before we do the show. I say, hey, Tate, what's going on with you? He goes, I just watched Waterworld. It's Tate Fresh Frazier. Fresh off the boat. Yes, happy yeah. to be here. On a heat check, This is uh, I feel very official because it's actually NBA playoff time. At this point, I don't think my opinions would matter in the world of NBA, but I'm happy to be here and sit across from you because now I feel validated. If John Gonzalez has asked me questions <laughs> about the NBA, then I feel good about myself. I love that you are watching the NBA. I said to you, Bring Titus <laughs> along, and you said, nah. But you were watching NBA, but before you watched the NBA, you were actually watching Waterworld, which I i don't know what I'm more blown away by, your love of the NBA or your affinity for a movie that even Kevin Costner doesn't like. He loves that movie deep down, I think. Basically, I was scheduled to watch Waterworld at 9.30 in the morning with a couple of friends this morning. This uh, was a, like a play date that you, this that is, you put this together This is something that I, that I was doing today at 9.30. So I started my day watching Waterworld. Mm -hmm. As soon as the two-hour and 15-minute experience was in, ended, then I got to the point where I was going to watch basketball, turned it on. And then, of course, Raptor Sixers, great game, back and forth. And I don't, Sir, we don't, we're not Serge Ibaka gonna... scored more points than Joel Embiid. I can't. Even, I don't even know how to. Pro That's even more confounding than Waterworld. We're gonna. We're gonna maybe skip that one. We'll start with the uh, 
the one that just wrapped that you and Isaac and I watched together, Nuggets and Blazers. Twenty-two Blazers. million dollars Kevin Costner spent on Waterworld. Twenty-two just remember million that. dollars of his own money. I think it was well spent. <laughs> uh, Nuggets and Blazers. The Nuggets tie up the series two-two, basically on the Jamal Murray game. Jamal Murray played out of his brain. Thirty-four points in this game. 50% from the floor on 20 shots, made all 11 of his free throws, including several down the stretch when they were fouling and trying to get him to miss one. And there was a situation with C.J. McCollum where he took what looked like a three mm -hmm. in the corner that could have changed it as the seconds wound down. It was called a three initially, and instead Scott Foster, Scott Foster, who's like the only ref that anybody in the NBA who, or who likes the NBA knows by name, he changes the call to a two. That changes things, and now the Nuggets are tied 2-2. It's crazy. And I know that, you know, it's been the Dame Lillard playoffs. We keep talking about Dame Lillard doing everything. And in this game, we have to give our due to Jamal Murray because down the stretch, I mean, he just steps up to the free throw line and makes every single free throw in a moment where even the last, I think it ended up being 116-112, the last time that Rodney Hood fouled him going down, you could tell Rodney Hood gave him a little extra shove. Yeah. Just to maybe get in his head. He's like, look, you've made 10 out of 10 from the free throw line. Rodney Hood tackled him. <laughs> yeah, he's like, maybe, maybe if I hit him hard, I'll get in his head and he can miss one of these free throws. But instead, cold-blooded goes up in Portland, makes the free throws. And uh, I think that, that says a lot about Jamal Murray. Jamal Murray, this these playoffs has been... Uh, hot and cold. Hit or miss, hot mm -hmm. and cold, good or bad. This was the best possible version that we could get of Jamal Murray in a game that was critical for Denver because as Kevin Pelton pointed out, uh, Kevin Pelton from ESPN, things really change. The odds super change uh, in these games. If the higher seed ties it up in game four at 2-2, they go on to win the series almost 80% of the time, 79% of the time. If the higher seed falls behind 3-1, they win just 11% of the series. So this was a critical game for Denver, a critical game for Portland. And I thought it looked to me like for much of the second half, that this was going to be a Blazers win. And then all of a sudden, as I said, Jamal Murray just goes lights out. And there were moments in the, in the playoffs where he has disappeared. And then there are moments when he's just looked like an absolute killer. And this was the killer moment. And it was a killer moment from the free throw line, and I think yeah. that'll probably get lost in the shuffle because it's not pulling up and hitting a three in someone's face. But the guy that was doing that, Will Barton, I have to give Will, Will Barton. His Will two. Barton He's hit like, two big threes. Yes. I'm a Will Barton stand. I've always liked him. But to your point about free throws, Jamal Gamari goes and makes uh, eleven of eleven. Dame Lillard, who's usually like ice cold from the mm -hmm. line, one of the best free Actually throw ice shooters cold this time. Yeah, yeah, cold blooded is what I meant. <laughs> one of the best free throw shooters in in all of the NBA. Yeah. missed a couple of crucial free throws in the fourth quarter. So. I mean, this could have gone the other way if not for a couple of breaks. You know, the three ball that ends up as a two. Dame missing a couple of shots. Denver steals one, and now all of a sudden they've got home court again. And it got to the point where we got the—it's uh, the, almost been overused at this point. The refs, you suck. The chant that Blake Griffin so yeah, you know, yeah, beautifully yeah. did early in the playoffs, and now uh, Portland does that. And I think Dame has been so good in the third quarter. Tonight was in his night in the third quarter, and I think one of the biggest moments in the game when I saw it sort of flip for the Nuggets was Dame goes down, he tries to get a call, makes a layup. He's yelling at Scott Foster about not getting the call. Yeah. Jokic goes down. Jokic gets the call right after that. Terry Stotts is all upset. He's about to get a technical. He gets held back by C.J. McCollum, and as soon as that's happening, Zach Collins is now standing <laughs> at the line, and who would have thought that Zach Collins would be the one to get a technical foul in this game, but he decides to let it be known how he feels about the foul call, and then he gets teed up, and then from there— It's it downhill. Just, yeah, it started rolling for the Nuggets. You know, Zach Collins may be a bad spot for you to get teed up there, mm -hmm. guy. Nobody on the Blazers wanted to get teed up there, but for the young guy to do that in a spot where they can't be giving away points and opportunities— not the best look for Zach Collins. It's a real shame. I wanted this, like, after the quadruple overtime game, I was really feeling Sixers, Blazers, both going up 3-1, because as listeners of Heat Check know, I, I obviously spent a good time of my career and my life watching the Sixers, but Portland is like my adopted West Coast mm -hmm. Team. I really you love the like, city. You were like, I would like to go to Portland for the I finals. I love the city. Yes. I love the aesthetic. I love the team. Like the whole bit. It's uh, a great place to raise a family. Like if you want a nice, like family life, suburbia, run around with your kids, is that have right? a dog. Oh, how do you have this knowledge? You don't oh, have I, a, you don't have any kids. You don't I, have any kids, do you? No. That we know well, about. That we know about. Right. Let's hope anyone. If anyone on the airways knows anything, please right. don't let please, me know right. for right now. Uh, but yeah, Portland's just. I've been. I went up there a couple times in the fall. I got a couple friends that work in Nike. I just you know, Portland's a beautiful place. And while you were up there, you found out it was a great place to raise 
raise children? There were so many <laughs> like people running around with their dogs oh, like oh, in shape. And you then gleaned you this on yeah, your own. Where, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, right. we're in their Nike stuff and now Adidas is up there and I, I think it's a whole little moment for Portland. So I, I'm behind it as well. I'm I, enjoying Portland. I thought it was a moment for Portland too. They had a moment in the first round. They were having a moment after this quad overtime victory the other night that was just a bananas game. I really Seth Curry had a moment in this Seth game. Seth Curry had a moment. Yes. Actually, so Seth Curry had 16 points the first time he's ever scored in double figures in the playoffs. He also made more three-pointers in the second quarter alone mm -hmm. than his brother made in the whole of game three. So Seth Curry, you get bragging rights at dinner. But unfortunately for the Trailblazers, it still doesn't work out. And this is a game where, again, Jamal Murray was a killer. Paul Millsap had a really good game. He had 21 points and 10 rebounds. Jokic was Jokic. There was a moment Jokic had a triple double. There was a moment late in the game where it looked like he was going to take a shot and instead he threw this beautiful no look pass to Gary Harris, who was cutting to the basket and ended up with an and one. So Jokic was Jokic. Jokic, by the way, he deserves a little rest. Mm -hmm. He played 65 minutes in the quad overtime game. He played 39 minutes in this game. He's got to be tired as hell. And you mentioned that pass to Gary Harris. That was a moment when it looked like he tweaked his knee. Like he came up limping right after that, went right to the bench. And there was a, I guess if you were in the building, you were a little bit scared for Jokic, especially because I'll say this, going into the series, all I wanted, I know we can't have it because he's hurt, but I wanted Nurkic versus Jokic. Who is going Back to be the, the itch that, you know, that that dominates <laughs> and owns this, uh, especially with the past, you know, being traded and all that sort of stuff. But uh, we're missing out of that. So to see Jokic almost get injured, I was holding my heart at that sure. point because we'll never want to see that. Uh, again, that was such a big play. And I mean, I know he's not the MVP, but I mean, he needs to be in the discussion as far as like so far in the playoffs. Jokic, what he's been able to do, another triple double in this game, right? Yeah. So, him being able to pass the ball out of the paint, kick it out to guys like Gary Harris, Will Barton, get those open threes, Torrey Craig. Malik Beasley is probably one of my favorite players in the NBA. There's so many guards they have coming off the bench they for, do. They, for Denver, and Jokic finds them, and it, you know it's a nice little they, thing. They have had a, one of the deeper benches in the NBA all season. They've honored Morris and Beasley this season. It's been great for them. And Jokic, as you mentioned, has been a killer all playoffs. I would say the two best players in the playoffs across the board have been Katie and Kawhi, mm -hmm. and right behind them. If they're number one with a bullet, then Jokic is 1A. Like, he's been so, so good and so, so fun to watch. I just didn't think that that would be enough in this game. It, it still felt like it was going to end up being Portland's game, especially because lost in all this was CJ McCollum, just like Jamal Murray, goes 10 for 20 from the floor. He made four of eight from three, made all but one of his free throws, had another really great game from CJ McCollum. And then, again, if that three ball is a three ball instead of a two... Now, all of a sudden, the fouling situation gets different. Now, all of a sudden, maybe Portland pulls it off. They go up 3-1, maybe. And instead, it's 2-2. And it's so difficult, as we mentioned with the Kevin Pelton stat, for the lower seed to come back from 2-2. It generally doesn't go their way. And it's for Denver to be able to get home court back. Obviously, yeah. that's a big thing for them. Yeah. And you talk about the confidence being that two seed. I feel like, I mean, and I'm not around the NBA talk as much as you are. You're in this whole world. But from the outside looking in, I hear more people talk about it seems like Denver has to prove that they're the two seed to everyone, that they belong to be the two seed. And everyone has sort of coordinated Portland at one point, you know what I mean, after they knock out OKC. And now this is a nice game, I think, to say, wait a second, Denver is the number two seed in the West for a reason. And, you know, now they're going back home. For a reason. And, like, I have been, as listeners to Heat Check know, skeptical of Denver. I've liked watching them all season. I've enjoyed the Nikola Jokic experience. I'm a big Will Barton guy, although he hasn't looked as good coming back from his injury. Jamal Murray obviously has had a breakout sort of season. And yet my thing with them was I thought it was going to be difficult for them in the playoffs, depending on the matchup. Spurs took them to seven games. Mm -hmm. And then now all of a sudden they're sort of locked in this pitched battle with the Blazers because after Jokic, I wanted to see well, who was going to be their guy. Because obviously they're going to key on Jokic. Jokic is going to do his Jokic thing. But somebody else needs to step up. We've gotten the answer. It's Jamal Murray. He has been, when he's been off, yes, he's had some bad games. There's no doubt about it. But when he's been on, he's been a killer. And this game four was the best he's been maybe ever. This is this was a seminal game for him. Where were you on him coming out of college? What did you think he would be? Because I didn't, I wasn't sold on him. And it was a weird thing with him coming out because I kind of compared him to Devin Booker in the sense where he's not a point guard per se, but he's going to bring the ball up. He's going to mm -hmm. take a lot of shots. He's going to have an offense that's going to be dedicated to him. Are we sure that Jamal, you know, the classic, is that a good we, idea? are we sure Jamal Murray is going to be able to carry that load and be that guy? But I think he has the perfect situation with the Jokic type who is going to be the number one option. So now I think the worst shot he took in that game was late in the game when he drives all the way through and he takes that little turnaround and end up being an air ball. And that's sort of the Jamal yeah, Murray yeah, that, yeah. I was, that, I, yeah. that, that you worry about because you're like, 
he is sort of a playground mm-hmm. kind of style guy where he's like, I have to take this shot and I'm going to jump up in the air and contort and do whatever I need to do to make it happen. And it was a bad idea. It was a bad idea, you know, <laughs> yeah. and sometimes that confidence, that. Yeah, yeah. It, that can come with some problems. But I think in this game, and I, I think Malone's been great with him getting on him. You know, when he has played bad, Malone's like, I told Jamal he played bad. He knows he played bad. He's going to bounce back. And I think what you take away from all that stuff watching him play is that he has confidence. He can bounce back. And I like that in a superstar because obviously we have our good days, our bad days. And Jamal Murray, this was a great day for him. Like you said, a seminal moment. I think this is the best I've ever seen him play as far as, like, it means a lot, it matters, and he steps up to the free throw line and he makes these shots he, and moves on. He's way, way better now than I ever anticipated he mm. would be. And there was a, remember there was a time when, like, he was sort of, as you said, sort of a combo guard. They weren't sure what to do with him. Like, maybe he would be better as a shooting guard or whatever. Having him as the point guard with this team with Jokic, it's unlocked something. I mean, when he's on, he's been really good. Uh, before we move on reluctantly <laughs> to the next series. I don't want to do it to you. It's 2-2 right now with Nuggets and Blazers. Who do you think is going to win the series? I think I'm still going to stick with, as much as I, I was impressed with the Nuggets, it was a nice road win. I like to see guys like, you know, like you said, Will Barton step up and make some big shots. I do think that the Trail Blazers, I like continuity, and I think that they have a team that they understand each other. They know what they're looking for in the moments, and I think that they have the ultimate killer left in the playoffs as far as, I want to take that shot, and I want to knock you out. And we know who that is. That's Dame Lillard. I think it's going to go seven games, though. And I need think more if, Dame time. Yeah, we need more Dame time, and I think we're going to get that in the series. And I think Portland is almost better sometimes when their back's against the wall. So I would take Portland in seven. I would love for it to go seven because I like basketball, and this yes. has been really fun. This series has been really fun. Let's go seven games, and I would also like to see Portland win, so we'll I go mean, with that. don't you think the four-overtime game just endeared themselves to America? Yes. that's so what, much fun. And in this series, you know, everyone's talking about every other series, all the major storylines, the bigger players, but this has been probably this one of the best bu- series in the second round. Let's keep it going. A series that I'm less enthusiastic about, <laughs> that I was previously very enthusiastic about, the Raptors and the Sixers, I really believe— See, this is my problem. As a Philadelphian, just when you start— Like, you're conditioned— as you're growing up, Mm -hmm. to not believe in things. Yes. Right? Like, just don't believe. It's way easier that way. Hate, expect the worst. Like, that's kind of our comfort zone, misery. Yes. And then you start to believe, and (laughs) shit goes sideways. (laughs) Kawhi Leonard is an absolute killer. The 76, they started off super slow. They weren't shooting well, and they were only down two at the half. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. The 76ers are going to win this game, and instead they do not, for a number of different reasons, not the least of which is Kawhi Leonard, who ends up helping the Raptors tie the series at 2-2. Kawhi goes for 39 points. I mean, he was just unbelievable. Like, he's impossible to stop. He had 14 rebounds and five assists, and he played amazing defense. And once again, if not for Kawhi, this series is all Sixers all the time. He's been incredible. Yeah, and you talked about it. Uh, it basically is the Kawhi Leonard show. And I think in this Without game, I like what Nick Nurse did where he has basically decided, I don't need to find a backup point guard because Kawhi Leonard is, is our backup point guard. Kawhi Leonard is going to play at the two for us. We're going to go big. I like that they went big and put Gasol with Ibaka. I saw that a little bit during the season, but not as much as I thought uh, after the trade, you know, with those two guys. Mm -hmm. And Gasol was great in this game. He had 16 points. He was sort of getting things rolling a little bit. That little pick and pop with him uh, has been nice and has, you know, kind of kept Embiid at a certain level, you know, having to pull him out a little bit, which I think, you know, says a lot. And then you talk about Kawhi Leonard being the difference. I mean, it's as simple as, he has the ball at the top of the key. There's really nothing going on. Ben Simmons is having to fight over a screen, and Bede's coming out, and he hits that three to get a four-point lead with 101 left on the clock in the fourth quarter. And cold-blooded Kawhi answers the bell, and so that's good. pretty much what it is, I mean, for the Raptors. It's it's unbelievable because, like, Siakam obviously wasn't right. He didn't make his first field goal until less than five minutes left but in the third quarter. But he was great on J.J. Like, he was chasing J.J. all over the place. And as much as, you know, we can talk about J.J. and, and how w- what he may do when he's limited and he's not making shots, he's so important to helping, mm-hmm. you know, obviously stretch out that Sixers offense. So if you have a guy like Siakam who's athletic, falling and running around, just tires him out. Which and is, almost didn't go. You know, almost didn't go because he was doubtful with a calf contusion. Like, Sixers conspiracy Twitter was convinced that he got a hurt tripping Embiid in game three. <laughs> and he wasn't moving well. He started out at 0 for 8 offensively. See, that's why I love Philadelphia. It's incredible. Because you guys, always across the board, I mean, and I talk about it coming from the Eagles fans. Yeah. There's another layer to everything, yeah. which I really appreciate. Sure. Never take everything as it is. You know what the I mean? The universe has, is always <laughs> conspiring against Philadelphia, as we know. But... Again, Kawhi sort of like even without Siakam, who's been his running mate in this series, Mm -hmm. sort of puts them on his back. Yes, Gasol played better. Yes, Kyle Lowry played better. They had a pretty good game from Ibaka off the bench. About the bench thing, like all season long, I have been lauding the Raptors for being super deep. And at some point along the way in the playoffs, 
The Raptors bench went to shit. Mm-hmm. They've got nobody on their bench. They got 32 minutes out of Serge Ibaka on their bench. He was the only person off the bench to score. 12 points from him, and that was it. And still, the Raptors end up beating the Sixers, which makes my head hurt. It's kind of interesting to me because it, Van Vliet's been playing, right? And and I think that they're deciding that Van Vliet's probably not going to be right for this series. So now Pat McCall is playing. If you don't, Pat yeah. McCall got minutes. <laughs> exactly. Pat McCall got like what, like five five minutes or so in this. Yes, game. he got five minutes in a very like, odd lineup. And I like Norm Powell too. So it's like I could see Norm Powell getting more PT in this series. But I think you're, it's pretty much what it is. Like you said, it's a one man band at this point. It is you know Swiss Beats and Kawhi Leonard. It, yeah. it, it is what it is. You know what I mean? You're saying. Saying, this is the best player on our team. We know that we're going to run through him. He plays 43 minutes in this game. This is our team. And it works when Embiid is battling these weird sicknesses, I guess, is, uh, is, is, is the word that's coming out. Is that because game three, that was probably the most dominant performance. It was a killer. In the playoffs. Embiid looked incredible in that game. And in game four, he almost didn't go. So as it turns out, Embiid uh, did not have a good game in game four. 11 points, only made uh, two of seven field goals. He just looked off all day. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, Brett Brown said he got a text from Embiid at like 6.20 in the morning and said, I don't feel good. I haven't slept all night. I might not play. Now, Mm -hmm. he ended up playing, and Brett Brown was excited that he did play. He apparently got an IV, right, in the morning. So that was one other report I saw that he actually had someone come give him an IV that early in the morning. Yeah, it was. he. But see, here's the other thing. Like when Embiid is off. Obviously, it's going to throw everything off for the mm-hmm. Sixers. But there is moments with Embiid, and we saw this in the playoffs last year, and I was hoping that he had graduated past it this season, especially because, as you mentioned, he played so well in Game 3. But in this Game 4, down the stretch, we saw that Embiid where in critical moments in the fourth quarter, he makes bad decisions and either like fumbles it out of bounds, turns it over, misses a shot. Like Crunch time, critical Embiid in these crucial playoff games is still not the Embiid I need him to be. And maybe that's a product of he's sick again Mm -hmm. or he's just not right physically with his knee or his back. There's a a dunk earlier in the game where he landed and he grimaced. But when he's like not taking over these games, he's almost, not almost, he's hurting them in some situations. He, He didn't help. In this game. I was going to say, Embiid is, I love watching Joel Embiid play basketball. Yeah. And that, that is 100%. And when you see something in game three and you see that big dunk that he threw down and then he's going to the crowd and he's telling the crowd to raise up, you're like, this is the Joel Embiid that we want. This is the leader of the Sixers. Sure. And you got AI sitting on the sideline with Michael Rubin. They're like, you know, <laughs> Meek Mill, everyone's high-fiving each other. It's all happening. It's, it's a crazy in-game it, experience. Yeah, and it's, it's just like a beautiful thing when it's at that moment. You're like, oh, this is Philadelphia. This is what the process was for. Yeah. And you get that game three hype and you get Embiid it's, at that height. And then the other side of that, I mean, it's such a pendulum. The highs back and, and forth. lows. Yes. yes, I was there. Which is frustrating because I think Embiid is the best. I mean, he's he could be the best player in the playoffs talent-wise because we talked about Kawhi, KD. Embiid could be in that class. It could be those three guys as he far could as be. supreme talent. When he's on, he's amazing. And when he's off, like, in game four, it's less amazing. Uh, Jimmy Butler was really the story for the second. I mean, J.J. had a, a really nice game for J.J. had four threes. Um, but Pretty much, I mean, like Ben Simmons, once again, offensively sort of disappeared. They've moved him sort of out of the point guard duties and into you're going to be a screen and roll man. You're going to be in the dunker spot on the baseline. You're going to help with floor spacing. But mostly in this series, he's been deployed as a primary stopper, you know, and I'm using that in quotes because mm-hmm. nobody stopped Kawhi, but he's been their like main guy defensively. Like you're going to draw the most difficult defensive assignment. Fine. Jimmy Butler has really reemerged in this series. Like I was sort of lukewarm on the idea of them retaining Jimmy Butler. <laughs> and now all of a sudden I'm back to going, shit, I think you got to give him the max. He was really good. 29 points, 11 rebounds. If not for him in this game, I wonder how bad that score looks because he came to play and the rest of the team was sort of hit or miss. And that's sort of Jimmy's whole thing is that Jimmy's always going to come to play. He had that big bank shot where he just like turns around and throws it up Glass. and it goes. Yeah, yes. but, and that is what Jimmy Butler has always been. He's been a bulldog. I remember he told the story when he got traded to the Sixers. He's like, AI hey, used to always tell me that I should be in Philadelphia just the way mentally I made up where – I can shrug off whatever sort of criticism is coming, and it usually is coming from a place of love, as we know from Philadelphia fans. Yeah, of and course. You can shrug that off and then move on and keep things going. And I think that is why he's been fine in these playoffs as has been the up and downs because Jimmy understands that and has been there, and I think he has that mentality where he's kind of just a bulldog. It is what it is, and he's been able to score. But every single time Jimmy Butler's like when he has his 35-point game, 
it usually means the Sixers lost because he's having to do too much. Yeah. He's not supposed to be the primary guy. And uh, when Embiid is not there, you know, offensively to be able to score and, and, and shoulder that burden at some level. And Ben is, like you said, doing the thing with Kawhi where he's doing everything on defense and expending so much trying, energy on trying defense to, and trying yeah. to. That sets them in a situation where, good. where Serge Ibaka is guarding Tobias Harris and Tobias Harris is going seven for 23. So let's talk about this for a second because so you've got Jimmy Butler who played well. You've got J.J. Redick who played well. And Bede and Simmons did not play well and they're going to take a lot of the heat for this. But Tobias Harris is on this team where they, they traded a shit ton to get Tobias Harris. They expect to retain him and sign him because he fits in with their timeline and he feels like a good complimentary piece for them. Mm-hmm. Tobias Harris in a game where they absolutely needed to win for, because we mentioned the Kevin Pelton stats, how this sort of a critical game for both teams, especially the, the underdog seed. And now all of a sudden Toronto's got home court advantage back and the Sixers have to figure out a way to win one game up in Toronto and then also win game six in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. which is going to be difficult. Tobias Harris took 23 shots in this game. He made seven. He took 13 three-pointers. 13. Mm. He made two. Let's bring in resident (laughs) Tobias Harris expert, Isaac Lee. Mm. Isaac Lee, what say you for your guy, Tobias Harris? I've been saying this all season. Tobias Harris will play well for you right up until it actually counts, and then he'll disappear. This is what he does. He is so passive to a point where... If there's any stakes, then he will fail. It's just how he's He wasn't been. passive today. He was taking the shots. He just wasn't making them. I mean, they went out and they bolstered this lineup, right? And supposedly they have the best lineup east of San Francisco, best starting five. That's what we've heard so many mm-hmm. times. Yeah. But if Embiid and Simmons aren't going to be there for you, you're getting something out of Butler. You're getting something out of Redick. You absolutely have to get something more out of Tobias Harris. He just he did he, not he doesn't play have well. it. He doesn't have it. He does not have it in him to step up in big moments and actually make big plays. It's just you can't let Serge Ibaka come off the bench and shut you down. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's that's pretty much where we're at. I always go to Isaac on Tobias Harris. It's you put the quarter, you wind him <laughs> in, you wind him up, you put the quarter, and off he goes. Mm-hmm. It like really triggers him for some reason. I enjoy it. I enjoy that you can throw that. I, I enjoy that there's someone that deems himself a Tobias Harris expert. I yeah. think I think <laughs> I think that's actually good news for Tobias Harris. As much as he may not be able to step up in these big moments, at least he has an expert. People are talking about him enough for that. So I mean, Stockholm syndrome more than anything else. One, <laughs> so we talked about this at the top of the show, but Isaac has graciously agreed to get a Mike Scott hive tattoo on his oh, cheek. Oh yes, no. So maybe Beautiful. on his other cheek, he gets the Tobias Harris hive. Oh, there you go. We'll see how it goes. Matching tattoos. Nope. You need um, to wear the headband, like with the, he- uh, Mike the headband. Scott, yeah. It's on the tattoo. Okay, there you go. So yeah, it's Ninja Turtle look, mode. It's going to look good. We'll make sure we put that on the Ringer Instagram when, when nope. it happens when Isaac gets in. Um, you have a lot of things to do. We're going to bring in Danny Chow in a second. I want the 76ers to pull off the series for all my friends and family. Yes. I thought it was going to happen. As I said, I was starting to believe. Now I'm back to not believing. I, I had the Raptors in six games before the series starts. I think it might go seven, but I'm not feeling good about the Sixers' upset chances here. You figure it out for me. Who's going to win? I will say this. I believed going into both these series, and I thought that there was a chance that Kawhi Leonard could be, I guess, great enough to ascend a certain level to be able to beat the Sixers. But the Sixers are a better team, I think. And I, and I believe in a seven-game series, the Sixers should win. But I think that they— <laughs> They weren't a better team during the regular season. And- exactly, exactly. But I'm talking about, like, playoff time. I thought that, you know, Ben's going to be playing better defense. He's mm-hmm. going to buy all the way in. There's so many ways. That's Offensively, the prob- he's a zero right now. It's the problem with, I don't know what Joel Embiid I'm going to get yeah. from day to day. And I or think, if you're going to get him at all. Yeah, the consistency is a, is a factor that plays in all this. And uh, I, I keep talking myself in circles here with both these series, really even though I feel better about picking the Blazers, I think Kawhi Leonard is a man on a mission in some weird world where he believes that he is the best player in the Mm -hmm. world and he is not getting his due for that. And I think that he is singularly going to be able to take the Raptors to the next round. He has right now. So far, everything that they've achieved in this series has been because of Kawhi Leonard. There's been some Pascal Siakam, no doubt about it. Not in game four, but in the first three games, he was really good. But mostly it's just Kawhi. Mostly it's like Kawhi's got this. And until the Sixers figure out a way to... Not stop him, but slow him even a little bit. I think it's going to be difficult. And and it's one of those things, too, where it's like if Danny Green has a game where he just happens to start hitting these open threes that he's getting and it it starts to fall, then, you know, it's just one of those nights where you just kind of get knocked out by the percentages. And uh, I could see that happening. I just really want the real Joel Embiid to be here, to stay here. Give us the full Embiid. Come on. We need it. Give us the full Embiid. Uh, Make sure you listen to him. He's (laughs) one half of the One Shining podcast. 
You're going to be doing football stuff. Football will be back eventually. Yeah, football will be back. I do against all odds with Cousin Sal. And you then could, uh, I'm just the rail. We both live on the west side of Los yes. Angeles, so we're, we're going to figure, you know, we're, we're going to go hang break out bread. on our side. We're yeah, going to hang gonna, out gonna on the bread. west side. Come see us on the west side. Tate Frazier, you're the best. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate you. All right, we thank Tate Frazier. Before we bring in Danny Chow, a quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode of Heat Check is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring used to be hard. Multiple job sites, stacks of resumes, a confusing review process. But today, hiring can be easy, and you only have to go to one place to get it done. It's ZipRecruiter.com slash NBA. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply for your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address. It's ZipRecruiter.com slash RingerNBA. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash R-I-N-G-E-R-N-B-A. ZipRecruiter.com slash RingerNBA. ZipRecruiter, it's the smartest way to hire. And now, back to Heat Check. Boom shakalaka! He's heating up! All right, joining me in the studio, he's an editor, he's a writer extraordinaire, one-third of the corner three, you hear him on House of Carbs, he's everywhere, it's Danny Chow. Hello. Uh, it's been a while. It has been a while. I'm glad to have you back. There were many things that I wanted to discuss with you. First, we'll start with Rockets Warriors. Rockets get back into the series at 2-1, uh, overtime win in game three. Not a good look for Steph Curry. Steph Curry at the back end of the game, like completely decomposed. I don't think there's anything left of it. It was like an end game, or no, I would I guess it would be Infinity War, where like all of a sudden he just he just disappeared on everybody. You you could honestly make any Marvel reference sure. and, and I would just be like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that's Are you right. not a Marvel person? Does I, the ringer brass know about this? I don't watch Game of Thrones either. Holy oh shit, God. how do you work here? <laughs> this is incredible. I, I've Tell kind of me, skated I, by for the past six years working on those same people. It's amazing. Do other people know about this, or are we breaking news on Heat Check? No, they all know about this. All right, so they should. no MCU, mm -hmm. no Game of Thrones. This is all of a sudden not a basketball podcast. <laughs> Have you seen A Star is Born? No. Oh, my oh God. Oh, my God. I, I've heard the song. I can probably sing the entire song, but like I, this I don't. This is incredible. Yeah. I'm blown away. You are, you are a ringer unicorn. If you, I've gotten that a lot. Shouts out to Sean Fantasy. For a lot of reasons, you're a ringer unicorn, but I, I think if we pulled every single person at the ringer, I don't think anybody else would be 0 for 3 in those categories. You're just shaking your head at me. I'm here. <laughs> this is incredible. Incredible heat check on heat check by Danny Chael. Uh, Steph Curry, who absolutely disappeared. He misses a layup in overtime. Harden hits a step back three. And then Steph had a wide open look at the rim, drove the lane. And this has happened to him before yeah. where he has fucked up dunks. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the first one I felt was more memeable where he was like literally trying to go up for it. Mm -hmm. And he just slipped so hard and just skidded out of bounds. I yeah. think this was like a regular season game a few months ago. Yeah, this one, he just got rejected by the rim. I mean, it wasn't good. It wasn't good for him. It wasn't good for the Warriors. I thought the Warriors were going to end up winning that game and go up 3-0. Instead, the Rockets climbed back into it. The series has been kind of weird because it felt like the Rockets could have stolen game one. Absolutely. I didn't feel like that in game two. Harden went out with the eye laceration or injury or whatever you want to call it, where you know he had to go back and, and get the old eye drops out. And CP sort of vanished in multiple games. Like in game three... CP had, what, uh, 14 points, 8 rebounds, 7 assists. You look at his line and you go, that's not terrible. It's, it's pretty good. It's, it's a, a Kyle good, Lowry like, line. It's kind of a CP line, and yet I didn't feel like he was influential in any of these games. Well, the final four minutes, I was watching him specifically. I'm just like, wow, this guy is completely out of the loop, out, mm -hmm. of, like, out of his comfort zone. He was passing up on strange plays. He was driving into traffic, expecting— He was being guarded by Clay, who's guarded him very, very well the entire series. Yeah. And somehow expected things to go way different in the final seconds of the game where refs are not going to be calling fouls. That final regulation play was just like, why did you not give this to Harden? What, what is going on here? Yeah, there. I mean, there was a number of moments in game three that I was sort of curious about. But the Rockets win, and like I'm still not entirely sure where they fit in this series. Like. Right. I, Initially, I thought, oh, yeah, they're in this series. This is good. And then I thought, not that in game two. And now in game three, after game three, I'm just sort of shoulder shrugging my way through it, this. How do you feel about the Rockets? What did they do better in game three? Do you think that they're back in the series now? I think the biggest key for them in game three was just 
how dominant they were on the rebounding totals. Mm-hmm. They were just atrocious in the first two games. Crushed crushed the Warriors yeah. on the glass by yeah. 20. By 20. And then half of that, 10 of those rebounds were offensive rebounds that yep. they had. They had 10 more offensive rebounds than the Warriors did. And that, that was just the big key right there. Capella has been Capella. bad. He has been bad, although they got 35 minutes out of him in, the, in Game 3. He had another double-double, which I mentioned after Game 2, and Haley blew it off. She said it doesn't count for big guys. But, but and this is a low bar, Game 3 was his best game. Right, and basically what you need from him is extending those possessions. He had mm-hmm. five offensive rebounds. When he was on the court, he got enough buckets to remain viable, but you still look at his plus-minus, and he, now he's like minus like 40 something 60 <laughs> yeah, on the series it's, it's like not good he still has the worst plus minus of anyone on that team mm-hmm. but if he can extend these possessions if he could get these tap outs secure offensive rebounds defensive rebounds and give the rockets enough opportunities to let harden chris paul austin rivers i can't believe i'm listing austin yeah. rivers as one of these guys but he's been amazing in this series. 1000 percent, man like we've talked about it multiple times on heat check we talked about it on the emergency post game warriors rockets pod that we had with haley the other night where they need austin rivers i mean and i think that this is universal for playoff teams at this point where the rotation shortened to the point where you can only play a certain number mm-hmm. of players and you look at what the rockets have on that bench Guys who saw action in game three. Nene got nine minutes. Amazing nine minutes, by the way. <laughs> Incredible nine minutes. The best nine minutes he's played in a while. Uh, Green had seven minutes. Shumpert, they had to run Shumpert out there. Who's, you want to talk about somebody who hasn't been good and that you don't want to play. Shumpert has been terrible. And then suddenly he hit like three threes. He did. He hit three threes, which back from the dead. But Austin Rivers has plainly been their best bench player. Yeah. There is a great stat out there. So when he's on the floor in the series, 52 minutes on the floor, the Rockets are outscoring the Warriors by 18.5 points per 100 possessions. It's an 18.5 net rating. When he's off the floor, they're getting outscored by 13.1 per 100. That's like a, what, I can't do math, like a 30-plus point swing per 100 possessions. That's why we have you on, so I don't have to do math, so that's good. (laughs) But um, after game one, with Rivers being out, we talked about this, and I thought, I can't believe we're actually saying this, but they really missed him in game one. And having him back matters because to the same reason why they've got to squeeze minutes out of Capella. You don't have other options. I mean, somebody has to play. You can't go with just your five starters and and then that's it. So you've got Austin Rivers coming off the bench and he's been great. Uh, Isaac, I want to bring you in here. As somebody who has watched and really loves Austin Rivers, he's been your favorite player for a lot while. As we've we've said on Heat Check, you have the Austin Rivers footy pajamas. You've got the fat head over your bed. What do you think about the Austin Rivers resurrection? I think it's a fraud. I think that people should be very wary of trusting in him and mm-hmm. piling on the praise that people have been giving him. He's just a warm body who's out there. He's a professional basketball player who is out there and is present on the court, and that's about it. You need the warm body, though, right now. You really yeah, do. Absolutely well, that's the thing. The you, if you're putting out Shumpert out there, yeah, Austin Rivers will be better and or about the equivalent of a uh, Iman Shumpert. 28 minutes out of Austin Rivers. He was there. Like we said, we, they squeezed some time out of Capella. I want to talk about your guy, though. Another reason why I brought you on. P.J. Tucker. Yeah. Like, his defense has been fantastic. Mm-hmm. He's all over the boards. End of game three, they put him on KD. In the final 15 minutes with Tucker as the primary defender, KD, who has been lights out all playoffs, I would say it's him and Kawhi for the best players in the playoffs by a Absolutely. wide margin. KD goes two for seven from the field in the final 15 minutes with Tucker as a primary defender. You guys are very close. Uh, You have sleepovers. Mm -hmm. You've broken bread together. I haven't made him breakfast, but we almost did. Fantastic. I I imagine he texted you right afterwards to tell you (laughs) how he felt after the game. What do you make of your guy, PJ? He has obviously been kind of the pivot point of this series. His performance in Game 3 was just nothing short of phenomenal on on really both ends of the floor. He he made like a a soft touch like floater hook shot mm-hmm. in the game and I was just like, "Oh, okay, yeah, the Rockets are winning this if if he's going to be making these shots." Yeah, there um, are moments when he falls apart offensively, like it disappears a game one wasn't a good one for right. him, but defensively he gives yeah. you any effort wise and on the glass, there's so many he's switchable on defense. The one thing with him, especially on KD is that KD has kind of had a history throughout his career of underperforming against these certain types of defenders, mm-hmm. like Tony Allen or Ron Artest, guys who are just 
really strongly built, have low leverage, you know, low centers of gravity, who can kind of get underneath KD without, and, and having the long arms to kind of contest him up, sure. up top, but really being able to control him from the base level down and directing where he can get to on the floor. I think PG Hooker is like an ideal player that you can kind of put on to KD in certain situations. I think Harden's done actually a fine job mm-hmm. as a similar type of player on defense. You're not going to stop KD. And no. so the, the only thing you can really do is Nobody just like, has. you know, yeah. Frustrate him. Yeah. Frustrating him is good. He's done that, certainly. I've always liked P.J. Tucker. I like him a lot because uh, you did a fun piece with him where you guys ate food and, and talked about basketball, and it was great. Also, he's an excellent game day dresser. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, just a killer outfit guy. Like, yeah. always comes up with something good. It's not like, you know, like, with Westbrook, he's known for fashion, but there are frequently misfires in his game where he, like, tries to pull off something crazy that nobody would do. P.J. Tucker always kills it. Savant. Excellent. Um, All right, for the Warriors, Steph has not scored over 20 points yet in this series. KD has largely carried the Warriors in pretty much every game in the playoffs. Are you at all worried about Steph Curry? Absolutely. I mean, he's shooting 25% from three. Yes, it's not good. Serious. It's awful. It probably has something to do with the nagging ankle, the nagging finger injuries. The thing about Steph is when he is fully healthy, there is— Nothing you can really do to stop him because he has just the utmost confidence. But he's the type of star who loses his edge with those knickknack injuries because he's such a, when he shoots, it's his entire body that's kind of working in tandem in unison Mm -hmm. to get his shot up. And so little like kinks in the machinery kind of throw off his flow, throw off his rhythm. And that's kind of the story we've seen over the past, you know, four years. When Steph has bad playoff games, they're really, really bad. It was incredibly bad. After uh, game three, hilarious, he goes, it wasn't my night. Yeah, no shit. In addition to (laughs) uh, having the rim block you, he went seven for 23 from the floor, only made two of his nine threes. As you mentioned, he's shooting 25% from three. I just expect him to get hot at some point. Yeah. like He'll go supernova and I'll go, of course, it's Steph Curry. But at the moment, if not for KD, I think the series is 2-1 the other way. Easily. Right. And look, if the Rockets had Austin Rivers game one, like Austin Rivers, the difference maker, who knows where this series is? <laughs> I'm most concerned about where this goes in game four in terms of, look, the Rockets had a very interesting lineup that they put out. It was basically their five smalls. Right. It was Chris Paul, James Harden, Austin Rivers, Eric Gordon, and PJ Tucker. PJ Tucker. No one taller than 6'6". Six, six. Which is interesting. Who the hell is the power forward there? I don't know. I mean, I think who's, it's who's, Rivers. who's anything? I don't yeah. know. If they can capitalize on those minutes, and they have, like that's basically their death lineup. You have four guys who can adequately, if not very profoundly, create for themselves mm-hmm. off the dribble. And then you have one just like utilitarian defender. That's the best way that they're going to like get as many points as possible on the Warriors. But you just can't use that lineup for that long. All right, before we go to the next series here that I want to talk to you about, make a prediction here. Are the Rockets back in it? What what chance do you give them of not just making this a series, but winning the series? How about a 35% chance? That's better than I would give them. Yeah. I I would give them maybe one in four. I still think it's the Warriors. Again, if you get anything more than what you've already gotten out of Steph, then I think all of a sudden this becomes considerably more difficult for them. I mean, the Splash Brothers shot like, Steph shot 30%. I think Clay shot like 37% in game three. Mm-hmm. That's not happening again. You're not getting those two having like that kind of off shooting night in consecutive games. Yeah, so. that's, I feel that way too. And like, and with Durant carrying them right now, like if all of a sudden one of those guys gets to even average, right. then it becomes a, a, a way tougher slog for Houston. But I would like them to get back in because I like basketball. All right, the other uh, series that we want to talk about here to the Eastern Conference, Bucks and Celtics. Bucks go up 2-1. Game three was very interesting. I, I feel like the Bucks had the control for most of it. Celtics fans were super quiet. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was sort of like a late game run where it looked like maybe Boston would get back into it. But by that time, and I love this, the arena, like a lot of people left in Boston. And I love when Boston is quiet. It's like my favorite sound. <laughs> it's really, it's really amazing. I have a lot of friends. We have a lot of people in Boston in our lives at work here. But personally, I have a lot of people from Boston in my life. And they love to text me when things are going well, when Kyrie is playing well, when the Celtics are winning. Oh, all of a sudden, Gordon Hayward, I got a lot of Gordon Hayward texts from them late in the regular <laughs> season in the playoffs. All of a sudden, my phone goes silent. Mm-hmm. Didn't hear from them in game three. I personally don't have too many Boston connections, and I personally don't have that many 
text firing off on my phone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that that's just a normal Friday night for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Uh, Giannis looked excellent. 32 points, 13 rebounds, eight assists, two steals, three blocks. He was all over the place. Your guy, George Hill. Talk about resurrections and needing somebody off the bench. George Hill's a thing again. He's a dependable guy. He is dependable as opposed to Eric Bledsoe, who has been by turns invisible and then useful and then invisible again. Right. That's exactly why they got George Hill. They saw last year Bledsoe was prone to playoff postseason slippage. Little disappearance. George Hill has been through it all. He's gone to the finals now with the Cavs last year. He obviously wasn't great there, but he's just a guy who will hit his shot. He's a calming presence Mm -hmm. on the floor. Doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Willing defender. Willing defender. Super long arms, super broad shoulders. He has the frame to defend multiple positions, which is exactly what you need in, you know, a switch-heavy defense against the Celtics. You need guys like that. Good weekend for guys that you like. Between Tucker and George Hill, like, those are, like, that's, like, really your wheelhouse. Right. Between George Hill and Pat Connaughton, the Bucks got 36 points off their bench uh, from Outrageous. those two guys alone. Ilyasova was, scored five and, and Tony Snell had two. So Tony Snell, by the way, completely fell off. Like there was a moment in time where Tony Snell was a useful player. Not anymore. He's played in the series? Like I, there you I, go. I've he played truly, <laughs> truly could completely <laughs> I forgot. forgot. I yeah. forgot about Tony Snell and I looked at the game and then the box score and I was like, oh shit, remember when Tony Snell used to play? And now they don't play hey, him. He got his money. So He got his money. But Pat Connaughton is all, all of a sudden in the rotation. When you're talking about needing guys off the bench, Hill and Connaughton were very useful for the Bucs. But this was very much like when Giannis is having a game like that, when he's going downhill, when he's getting to the rim, he's nigh unstoppable. And this was something that actually really frustrated the Boston Celtics. Giannis shot 22 free throws, mm-hmm. and Kyrie bitched about it afterwards oh, yeah. and complained about sending Giannis to the line that, that much. Kyrie shot 12 free throws himself. Right. I mean, now I get 22 is an outsized number, but what are the refs supposed to do and what are the Celtics supposed to do when a guy that large is coming at you full steam? He's getting contact on every single one of these plays. Mm-hmm. It's basically, you know, a modern iteration of what Shaq had to deal with every single play down the possession. It's like, these refs are going to have to call something because there's just so much contact being thrown around. And Giannis got the benefit of the call in game three. So it's just something that you have to deal with with Giannis as this unique specimen of a player. But I, in terms of how the Bucks are doing this, I, I feel like it's kind of a mutually beneficial relationship that he is getting from his supporting cast. The Bucks have shot 42 threes in the past two games on average. And they've shot those 42 threes 42%. Yeah. I mean, it's been the story for them all season. Like They're they're just fucking jacking threes. And when they make them, they're really good because you've always got Giannis. And when they don't, all of a sudden they're beatable. And, you know, they made their threes in game three. There was also a subhead on one of our stories. Haley did the winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to run this past you. The subhead for the story, you know, obviously the story was about Giannis. But the subhead was uh, MVP favorite Giannis. And I'm genuinely asking this. Is he? I think so. You think he's going to win it? I think he's going to win it. I went back and forth. I don't have a vote. I think I probably would have gone with Harden. I mm-hmm. I just was like struck by the favorite label there because I think like would, it's a toss up between would you them have, for me. Would it have changed anything if we went with front runner? Mm, yeah, the, I, you know, like the parsing of the language there I think is slightly better. Mm-hmm. I just, it never occurred to me that this was right, like going totally, to be a coronation. Yeah, it's definitely not like he's heads and tails above the rest. The Harden case is so strong. Yeah. It's historically strong. I, I could go with either one of <laughs> yeah. them, and it wouldn't surprise me if either mm-hmm. one of them won. But I, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is Giannis by a lot. Um, all right, so how do we feel about the Celtics now? Because I, I've said that I've made this point. I'm going to keep making this point. After the entire regular season, after a first-round playoff series, and now after three games in the second round, ask me what the Boston Celtics are. I have no idea. Right. I want to see what they look like in Game 4 if Marcus Smart plays. Yeah. Because he adds an element that there is no Celtic that can offer what he offers. When the Celtics play without him, they are very much a jump shooting team. And they're a jump shooting team with him. But when the Celtics play with Marcus Smart and they're missing their shots, they still have their defense and they still have a lot, this edge that they can hang with. That could change the tenor of the game. If the Celtics can hang tough, even when they're missing shots, that'll be a big factor going forward. That would be helpful. 
It would also be helpful if they keep the ball moving, if they share the ball, pass the ball. Shouts to our guy, Paul Flannery from SB Nation. He tweeted about this. When things go bad for them, when shots aren't falling, when they start to fall behind in the game, they go ISO and they don't move the ball. And that's not really their game. I mean, it's Kyrie's game, but it's not really the Celtics game. They are a much better team when they are sharing the ball. The ball is moving. When it sticks, all of a sudden the wheels come off. And you saw that a little bit in game three. And I thought, man, like, the Celtics just in game two were fantastic. And then all of a sudden, not so much. You've got Kyrie. Jalen Brown has emerged as, I don't know, arguably their second best player all of a mm-hmm. sudden. Like, yes, I know that Tatum outscored him in game three, but I don't know that Tatum has been a better player than him this postseason. Jalen Brown Tatum has offers, been good. Tatum offers one dimension. Yeah. If he's not scoring, then he's really not capable. Which I much. wouldn't have expected because I love Jason Tatum. I mean, like if you asked me about these two guys, not just for this season or this series, but for their entire careers, I'm taking Jason Tatum. But Jalen Brown has really emerged for them. They need him. Yeah. One, he's a more physically mature player. Two, he's just older, more mature player. And I think when the Celtics are at their best, and this is kind of why I, I was kind of downplaying all of the the concerns during the regular season. They're a team that's built for the playoffs. They're a team that's built to kind of take advantage of matchups and and dictate matchups because of all of the players they have in their disposal, have multiple skills, and can defend multiple positions. I feel like they're most themselves when they kind of take on the identity of like an Al Horford or when when a Jalen Brown ends up kind of becoming an unlikely hero. Kyrie doing the ISO, as you said, is not necessarily their game. Yeah. So when they have to resort game, to that. It's such a weird thing. Yeah. Like they need him to sometimes, but they also need to play within they, the confines of like yeah. the system and helping each other. And like they need it in their back pocket. Dichotomy. Yes, absolutely. They need it in their back pocket, but for it to be the featured thing and, and for him to, you know, I heard, I think it was Jeff Goodman who was like, oh, I talked to a Bucks player who will remain unnamed saying that, oh, Kyrie was basically just shouting at his teammates the entire <laughs> second half of the game. I love it. So I love bad Celtics. I love bad Kyrie. It's all it's wonderful. Uh, the Bucks are up two one. We are all Milwaukee Bucks fans to an extent. This is the part, the caveat, the to extent part. I think as people at the Ringer have mentioned, you might be you and Sharks might be the only people who are really excited about the potential for a Toronto Milwaukee Eastern Conference Finals. Like I just have a bunch of Z's above my head and a thought bubble right now. The t- Not the, for me. The two best players in the East. Go at it. In theory, you sh- you're right. In theory, you should look at it, and it, the ABC executives and ESPN executives should look at it and go, this should be good for us. I don't think it will be. Oh, absolutely not. It's a series devoid of drama. It's yeah. a series devoid of, like, very clear storylines. You're really just looking at excellence versus excellence. Two best— And it's boring. The two best guys in the Eastern Conference, two of the best players in the league— period, one of whom could be the MVP. The other guy is, as I mentioned, probably playing along with KD, the best basketball in the playoffs. He's playing for the best player in the world title right now. The two best teams in the Eastern Conference all season. And yet I go, "Ah, can't we just get Philly in Boston? Like, wouldn't that be way more yeah, dramatic? It, it, there's a, that's a wrench being thrown in. It, yeah, it, it'll like add wrench. intrigue, but no, I'm look. Throw some wrenches. I need that excellence. You want I, it. Yeah, I know absolutely. you do. So you're going with the Bucks in this series. Yeah. I am too. I, I want the Celtics to be gone, and then we'll figure out what happens with the Sixers. I, I've still got my fingers crossed for them. Danny Chow, make sure to read him on TheRinger.com. Make sure to check him out on Corner 3 now on Wednesdays. Yep. Moved up in the lineup. It's been fantastic. Uh, he does excellent work. Danny, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. All right, we thank Danny Chow. We thank Tate Frazier. As always, I thank my guy, Isaac Lee. Want to remind all of you, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Read all of our content on TheRinger.com. Don't forget, Mismatch is coming at you on Tuesday, Corner 3 on Wednesday, Group Chat on Thursday. And we're going to have these uh, periodic post-game micropods on your feed. So check out those as well as they hit you. Isaac and I will definitely be back with Heat Check next Sunday night from Monday morning. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye.